Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Friday, April 12, 2024, coming up on Roller Month on Twitch, streaming live on the Black Star Network. A small Alabama town gets sued after white officials refuse to allow its first black mayor uh, to uh, exercise his real duties for the last three years. Folks, we'll be joined by one of the attorneys from the NWCP Legal Defense Fund who filed an injunction to force the town to hold elections. The O.J. Simpson murder that will always be a trial uh, people will talk about. Tonight we'll chat with Carl Douglas who was on the defense team led by Johnny Cochran. Also, uh, Dr. Rachel Ross will join us in the studio to talk about sexual health. We're going to talk about SEX. Uh-huh. Yeah, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Also, um, Trump folks lie again. So they portray this whole deal how he shows up at the Atlanta University Center to just bump into black people who are voting for him. It was a paid op. It was all stage, folks. And I keep telling you our Republicans are not pro-life. In Florida, the governor signed the bill stopping cities from passing bills to make sure people have water breaks who work outdoors. 
These people are sick and demented. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. The first elected and first black mayor in New Bern, Alabama, has not been able to carry out his duties leaving the town because white folks there have blocked him from taking his seat for three years. Patrick Braxton assumed office by default in 2020 when he filed for office, and no one else, including the incumbent, did the same. Previous New Bern mayors had been appointed or ran unopposed, with several serving for more than 10 years. Many residents did not know they were even allowed to have elections. Seriously, Braxton has an ongoing lawsuit alleging the white town leaders arranged an illegal and secret special election preventing Braxton from appointing a majority black town council and New Bern voters from electing their candidates of choice. Now, New Bern is about 77 miles southwest of Birmingham, and its population is 80% black, 20% white. However, the town's leadership, except for Braxton and his town council, has been majority white for years. The Legal Defense Fund has filed a preliminary injunction to force New Bern to hold elections and to allow its citizens to vote for the first time in years. <sighs> My goodness, this is... Okay, so I know somebody's watching me right now, and you're saying y'all have got to be kidding. But remember what happened in Ferguson. Same thing, 6 7% black, and for long as they didn't have a black mayor. You often see this happen in these small towns in Alabama and Mississippi. And so we must understand this is a reality. Marina uh, Fujani joins us right now, special counsel of the LDF. Uh, she's been working on this. Okay, so, 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 so walk us through this. Walk us through this. Um, when is the last time they actually had an election? So as we understand it, the town of New Bern has not had elections since at least the last few decades. They may not have ever had elections before the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. The last few decades? That's right. What the hell? Like, what, what the hell? Do the people there not get news? Were they seeing elections happening everywhere else and no one said, hey, um, what about us? So what's been happening is that different white residents of the town have been appointing themselves and other white residents that they know to the positions of town council member and mayor. And it's been essentially a hand-me-down governance system for the past several decades. So nobody black said anything? No one? I, I'm, I'm baffled that you could have a majority black town and literally this just went on and it was okay. I think it is hard to wrap your mind around in terms of why before 2020, when Patrick Braxton decided to run for mayor, why did that happen previously? But that just hasn't been the practice. That hasn't been the history. And also remember that this town is quite segregated. So the black people in the town live in a different part of town, and they have basically tended to take care for, of themselves Um by themselves without help of the official town governance. So, I mean, I, I get segregation. Okay, so so all of a sudden, 
Um, no one decides to run, so Patrick goes, hey, I'm going to run. And what? They just said, nope, <laughs> you're not going to be the mayor. I mean, how, how, first of all, how does the state attorney general allow this to happen? I think that's a really good question. I think it that's where things really start to get complicated when Patrick Braxton decided to run for mayor. Um, at first, the outgoing mayor did not give him the proper information to qualify for a candidate of mayor, but Mr. Braxton was very intent on running and did the research that he needed to do so that he could still qualify. Um, and then I think the problems really began not only after he decided to run, but it was really after he recruited other residents. And then it was only black residents who decided to serve on his town council that the outgoing white power structure decided that they wanted to put a stop to that. How, how large is, I mean, how large is this, is this town's budget? Uh, what do they actually control? Uh, what are they in charge of? Well, New Bern is quite a small town that probably has between 200 to about 350 residents. Um, there's the you know, town post office, there's a town hall, um, there are a few other municipal buildings, but it's really quite, it's quite small. So I don't actually think that this dispute is about getting a lot of access to town funds. It seemed to be more about holding on to those um, vestiges of power and trying to maintain that white dominated town governance. So since this happened, I mean, have the black folks there woken up? Have they said, have they realized that, man, we've been getting screwed all these years and we now want justice? We want this to be done the right way? I think since Mayor Braxton decided to run, since he recruited his town council member, since all of the media attention and the lawsuit, I think it has really changed the conversations that are happening in the town of New Bern, and it's making the residents really think about, for the first time, having a town government that serves them. So where do we stand right now? I mean, is Braxton, is, is he in office? What's going on? Where we stand right now is that who the lawful mayor is and who the town council is, is in dispute. And it's really what the, the centerpiece of the lawsuit is. And we have a hearing on May 6th that is really going to go to the core of determining who the right mayor and town council should be and also making the town of New Bern hold elections. Is this in state court? Is this in federal court? That's in federal court in the Southern District of Alabama. Uh, have y'all heard anything from the state? From the town defendants? No, or no, no, from, from state secretary of state, from state attorney general, from the governor. No. Uh, is there a, I mean, where New, New Bern is, is are, I'm sure there's a county government there. Uh, so any of the county officials, uh, have you, how about the state rep or the state senator? the member of Congress that represents that area, anything? They haven't been in touch with the Legal Defense Fund, but maybe they've been in touch um, with Mayor Bra Braxton directly. Wow, I I'm just, I mean, it, it is just stunning that we can be in 2024 and these folks, uh, they're located in, in, you know, in the Black Belt are still trying to actually elect their own mayor in leadership. I absolutely. That's, that's just wild. Uh, so you said the hearing is May 6th? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. All right. Well, we certainly will be paying attention to see what happens. Thank you. All right. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Matt Manning, Civil Rights Attorney out of Corpus Christi. He joins us. Uh, also, Kayla Bethea, Communication Strategist, uh, joins us as well. Michael M. Hotel hosts the African History Network show out of Detroit. Matt, this is absolutely crazy, bro. This, uh, this is insane. Yeah, this is not only insane. I thought that there had to be some weird issue with the maybe city uh, ordinances or the codes 
So actually, while you were speaking with the attorney, I read the Alabama law because I was just confused. And, and basically, you know, in most states, they have a whole section of law that um, that relates to municipalities and corporations and basically how cities and towns are incorporated, what their powers are, all of that. So newborn would be a class eight municipality in the city, in the uh, state of Alabama. And the reason I mention that is because oftentimes there's a, there are gaps when they're very small cities and towns in terms of their ability to just govern themselves. So I thought maybe they had some kind of weird law that allowed the mayor to appoint everybody on the city council and some of the stuff I read in advance of this segment. But getting down to it, this is out and out racism and out and out preservation of power because the Alabama codes, as it relates to even class eight municipalities, talks all up and through about elections. So the fact that there haven't been elections here, um, I think is proof positive that there's clearly been a very caustic power dynamic, and there's been a power dynamic where even among 350 some odd people, the black people there have been cordoned off and been rendered unable to uh, participate fully in their democracy. So I'm hoping that the federal judge sees this as just a per se, you are being divested of your 15th Amendment right to vote, you're being divested of your right to be a fully participative citizen. And hopefully, uh, he or she, you know, not only issues the injunction, but make sure that the people of newborn actually get to have a voice. Uh, this is just, this is crazy, Kelly. Just crazy. It, it's crazy, but it's also really fascinating to me because after, you know, listening to um, the LDS attorney, or representative rather, I am now curious to know exactly how many other municipalities are in this exact same situation in that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of small towns just like New Bern, Alabama, and um, certainly throughout the South. I wonder just how many are in a similar or exact same predicament in that there are no elections because the town is so small and um, you know, I'm assuming the demographic is relatively older, usually small towns of this size. We're talking about people who have been there their entire lives, don't really, you know, venture out and then come back. We're talking about people who have been there and have stayed there their entire lives, um, residents who, you know, are pretty much used to how things are and aren't necessarily exposed to how um, things can be or are currently in the rest of the state, rest of the country, and, and beyond. So I think certainly the, the white residents of New Bern know and take advantage of that. And not only is that disgraceful, I think it really does need to be explored by the DOJ, because this is, in my opinion, an even bigger issue. Michael. Yeah, Roland, I know some people uh, act surprised by this, but uh, this doesn't surprise me at all, especially if you understand the history of Alabama. No, um, you look at the Alabama State Constitution in 1901, okay, that codified white supremacy. And that's not me saying that. That's the Encyclopedia of Alabama. When you go research it, they instituted poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African-American vote. When you go back and look at the lawsuit of Gomillion versus Lightfoot, 1961, this was to fight against the gerrymandering that the state of Alabama was doing in Tuskegee, Alabama, and locking out almost all of the African-American voters and, and bringing in uh, to this district uh, poor white voters. and. Tuskegee, Alabama, had a higher literacy rate than the surrounding white counties, largely because of Tuskegee Institute. But, but, but Michael, just, but, but Michael, yeah. Michael, no. I mean, first of all, we, you go through you go through the civil rights movement, the Black Freedom Movement. You got a, you got what happened in Selma. You got what happened in Birmingham. You get the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, there are only 77 miles from Birmingham. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a little surprised you don't have an election since 1965. I mean, I, I well. I mean, that's, that's, we ain't say 1985, 1995, yeah. 1965. Well, Roland, January 6, 2021, you had a group of domestic terrorists to try to throw over, overthrow the no, government. No, no, I, 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 I understand that. But an 80% black town, 20% white, not having an election since the 60s. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm, I, I in, in, that's, that's, that's still shocking. I'm not, I'm not saying it's right. No, 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 no. I'm just saying. I'm saying. I'm saying again. What? There's no news that is that. This is sort of like uh, the Japanese soldier, 
you know, who they found 30 years later uh, didn't realize the war was over. I, I, I just don't understand what, how, it, how, how people living in this town got no news about any election anywhere else in the country and was like, you know, we had one since 60-something. I'm just, uh, just saying. Uh, very quickly here, uh, the, one of the points I've made before numerous times on this show is oftentimes white people will value our vote and fear our vote more so than we will, okay? And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to condemn anybody in this town. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying white people fear the African-American vote. And in the words of, doc, uh, of the great master teacher, historian Dr. John Henry Clark, he would say, I'm surprised that you're surprised. Uh, this does not surprise I, me. I, I, it, it's... Uh, since, since the 60s, yeah, it surprises me. All right, got to go to break. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Trump rolls up to the Atlanta University Center and, oh, all the MAGA people, oh, look at the black people just in love with Trump. It was all a stage set up. We'll talk about it. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Terry and I... We couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. The clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching the band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you said, like, now we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Hey, what's up? Geek to the a place to be. Got kicked out your mama's university, creator, and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered. Uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? All right, folks. So, um, anytime Donald Trump does anything with black people, we should just automatically assume it's fake. Uh, and so, uh, so you've seen the videos. Uh, Trump dropping by this Chick-fil-A in the Atlanta University Center, uh, and uh, all he gives this black woman a hug, and oh Lord, MAGA has been just excited, and oh look at the black people just loving on Trump, and, and look look at this here, uh, and um, and like so here's here's uh, one of the videos they were like, look who popped by the AUC and. And went, while he was in Atlanta, let me start this over so I can play it for y'all, because it's actually, to me, it's, it's pretty hilarious. Um, and I'm going to pull up in a second, so give me a try to pull it up. Uh, and, and so, again, the way folks have played this is that this was just a surprise visit, and, and he, you know, he dropped by, and, and he's coming by, and, and look... Uh, and then, of course, you then you know, know, folks at Fox News, they love running with it, you know, and that, and that boy Lawrence B. Jones, you know, who ain't, who ain't never seen a fact he refuses to check. Um, he just, you know, just, it just evades, fact checking evades Lawrence B. Jones uh, like uh, a haircut. Uh, and so, uh, so, so check this out. Watch this here. Thank you, everybody. And if they run a little bit low, give them some extras, okay? 
Are you the boss? No, sir. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You take care of yourself. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, come on over here. Thank you. Come on over. Thank you. Free. Free. I, with that beautiful hair. Come on, Marika. Come on. Marika, James, I got your phone. I got your phone. Come on. Go ahead. Take it. Come on. Come on. Here we go. In place. In place. In place. Okay. Oh, I gotta go this way. Thank you. Sitting here, and again, it's like, oh, this is... And then the sister, she's talking about uh, the Atlanta University, talking about, oh, we support you, we support you. Folks on social media like, girl, who the hell is we? Who the hell is we? Like, who are you speaking about? We support Trump. Well, the folks at uh, Midas Touch, uh, they've been tweeting about this, and they were like, yeah, that was all a lie. Uh, let me show you, um, uh, uh, show you what they put up. Because uh, they, they talked about this, uh, saying that uh, what was portrayed as, you know, this impromptu thing, you'll see it right here, breaking Trump's viral hug at Chick-fil-A was actually with a MAGA operative. It turns out Michaela Montgomery is a political consultant who worked for the Georgia GOP for years and is a city director for Candace Owens' Blexit organization. Hmm, that sort of uh, blows up that BS... Uh, uh, nonsense, Kelly? I mean, and I really hope I'm not, you know, being too mean about this, but I have yet to see a group, singular, you know, a singular person or a group of black people around Trump that that looks presentable. And by that, I don't mean like respect about, respect about, uh, respectability politics and politically presentable. I mean, you know, the crusty wig, the the ingrown ah, hairs on the ah. beard, the the wrinkled shirts, the the disheveledness. And it's like you scrape the bottom of the barrel of what we represent. And I'm not saying that we're a monolith or anything like that, but it just goes to show you how far and deep inside our trenches you have to go in order to find black people. Uh, or any race, really, to stand next to Trump in confidence as though it is a good thing to do, as though you should be proud of doing it. That is, like, my biggest takeaway from seeing this footage and seeing this content. It's like, this is not a representation of Black people. This is not what we are about. And, and the... The, the pandering that these Black people have been doing, the, the groveling that I see them doing in order to be accepted oh, God, by it's, this it's... very racist, very bigoted, very ignorant white man, it's just astounding to me how far right. some of us are willing to go here's, in order to feel accepted. Here's this tweet here, Trump's press secretary. Uh, Michaela Montgomery, who met President Trump at a Chick-fil-A in Atlanta, joined Fox and Friends to discuss why she and so many in the black community are all in for Trump. It was staged. It was a joke, Michael. Come on. It, that's all it was. It was fraudulent. <laughs> what, what do you expect from a guy who gained fame from a fake, a reality TV show, and he wasn't the one that came up with the phrase, you're fired? And according to Joanne Reed on MSNBC, it was the producers of The Apprentice who determined who was going to be voted off as well. So uh, this is expected. Remember, 2015, when he came down that escalator at Trump Tower, we found out that those people, they're training for him. Many of them were paid to be there, okay? Then he came to uh, uh, Metro Detroit. I can't remember what he was in Detroit or uh, a suburb, but recently he was here in Metro Detroit and visited an auto plant, and we found out that, it, number one, it was a non-union auto plant, number one. Number two, many of those people who were said to be Trump supporters, they were paid to be there as well. So this is what you get, all right? We have to expose this fraud, and I saw that video today on uh, D.L. Hughley's um, Instagram page. We have to expose, expose this fraud and these grifters and then present the facts and evidence. Proper documentation ends all conversation. But this is what you're going to get. You're going to get more of this from Donald Trump, who's pandering and can't present any policies that are realistic that are going to help African Americans. Now, now it, compare that to what Donald that, Trump that, and, and Joe Biden, uh, uh, Kamala Harris have done, especially with student loan forgiveness, that, that, that continue today. Now, now here's and if y'all want to laugh, if you, if, if, if y'all want to see uh, a, a straight up minstrel show, okay, watch this. 
on the campaign trail for one voter who got a big hug from Trump at an Atlanta Chick-fil-A uh, while he met with supporters. Watch. Look at this. Here to tell us about it is that young woman herself, Michaela Montgomery. She's also the founder of a grassroots political group to conserve the culture. Uh, Michaela, I've been waiting for this interview all morning. So when... I've been waiting for this my whole life. <laughs> and I've been waiting to say both of y'all out y'all damn minds. Uh, Matt, but now Matt, 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 well, Matt, Matt, not only that, he goes there, he goes there and he lies. He talks, he mentions, uh, oh, I've done more for HBCUs than any president in history. Flat out lie. He mentions, mm -hmm. he mentions opportunity zones. Flat out lie. I mean, just lie, 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 lie. This was a staged event, and, and the Republicans are trying to push it out as if, oh, this was just spontaneous that he just, oh, just gave a hug to this sister. She's a campaign op. Can I yield my time to Kelly? Because I know Kelly wanted to get something in. I'm happy to, to yield that before I well, get Ke well, Ke Kelly's still trying to go in her appearance. So I want you, I was just, she, we got it. About what, about, about, it's, not okay. just about, it's not just about appearance, Roland. It's just, like, for me, I'm about packaging, right? If you, even if you're an op, even if you are paid to do something and make it look like something else, look good doing it. I got That's it. But, but, here's, but, here's, but here's my whole point. She's an op. So what they've tried, what they what they've done with this is try to play black people, and this is what they do. It's not real, Matt. And again, you you sit an op there who brings four or five other loud black people. The cameras mm -hmm. come there, and their whole deal is, ooh, see the black people just loving them some Trump. You're an op. You're not real. And so my whole deal is, every time he comes around black people and starts lying. Somebody used to be there saying, uh, every time, you keep saying you've done, you've done more for HBCUs than anybody else. How much? Can you give me the number? Can you tell me what did you do? Opportunity zones. Can you tell me exactly how much of that money went to uh, low-income residents, people of color? Please let me know that. They can't tell you. No, they can't. And that's why right now we need that brother with the viral video. Why are you always lying? Why the <laughs> you lying? That's what you right? Um, Notice I'm saying those partials right, but in any first, event, first of all, you first, first, <laughs> first of all, you talking about uh, my man off script. Uh, you talking about Scotty? So yeah, go ahead. Alias, that joint had me dying. But in any event, um, here's the thing: not only are they lying, it's like we have short memories because this is the same person who took out a full page ad calling for the death penalty in response to the exonerated five. So you know, 30 years later, to be acting as though you are a friend to black people or that you have, you know, black support in, a, in larger swaths than those who are paid or otherwise incentivized to come and support you is flatly dishonest. But the thing about this is we see Mr. Trump doing this in not only um, as it relates to true political events, but selling Bibles. Like, bro, come on, you are the person who least lives the edicts of the Bible, but you're selling Bibles? But there's such a large contingent of people out there who just are not daunted by that. And that's the bigger issue here, is that it seems like the Trump team is just emboldened to do and say whatever they want, because there's no real political loss and no political accountability for him continuing to lie. But what I think is especially problematic about this is that, look, you know, black people don't have to be monolithic. We are allowed to have our own individual thoughts, but you should never sell your self-respect in order to get clout. And that's what people like this young woman are doing, right? You're going to go and shuck and jive to uh, get your 15 minutes of fame, but it's it's ridiculous because if you agree with his policy positions, of which he has none, then you know you can trumpet that and say, look, these are my closely held beliefs on yep. actual policy. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing political pageantry, both from those pandering to him and Mr. Trump and his team pandering to black people uh, with you and, know, high top sales and uh, Bibles. Uh, and, 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 and it's it is no and it's also it's no shock. Uh, when you have uh, Lawrence Jones, uh, who will go on Fox News and just blatantly lie uh, and just act like, just like when he had that other fool with the, with the, ble the dude who supposed it was with BLM uh, in Vermont, uh, oh, yeah. the, the most softball of softball interviews, and the dude was just straight lying the whole time. And so, Lawrence, do a fact check. I mean, I mean, bump it to a fact. 
I mean, okay, maybe you don't search for one, but like bump into a fact one day. And, but again, that's what you see because what they love to present to their mostly white Fox News audience, hey, here are the blacks. Look at the blacks uh, who are supporting Trump. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm gonna say, say this here again for the low information voters out there, uh, the people who don't pay any attention, all of y'all who thought these checks were overflowing to the black community when Trump was there, just wanna remind y'all that was COVID. I just want to remind mm -hmm. y'all of that. So if y'all actually think that Trump is just going to be flowing checks to the black neighborhood uh, if he uh, actually wins, y'all all need to be drug tested because it ain't happening. And all of you are going to be in for a massive rude awakening when there comes more tax cuts for the rich and he leaves your broke asses out to dry like he's done Giuliani, like he's done everybody else who stood with him. But y'all go ahead and play a little game and actually think Trump has your black back. No, he plans on sending your black ass back to somewhere else. Because as he said, why can't we bring in more people from Norway, from Switzerland? What he's saying is white people. Just so y'all know. All right, going to break, we come back. It has been years since the O.J. Simpson trial. He's dead, and folks still are fighting over O.J. Did he do it? Did he not do it? Why he keep loving white women? I mean, it's, I, the online debates to me have been absolutely astounding since news came out about his death on yesterday. Next, we'll chat with Carl Douglas, uh, who was on the uh, dream, the legal dream team for O.J. Simpson during his double murder trial. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Be sure to join the Brain and Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average $50 each, uh, which would raise a million dollars. You can send your check, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The enormous impact of race, education, and affirmative action in America and how, believe it or not, white America is starting to feel a little bit of the pain. Dr. Natasha Waraku joins us with a case study of one suburban community and how it reacted when the minority students started to excel. And most people didn't say this explicitly, but was that, you know, the academics are getting, standards are getting higher in part because of the Asian kids and that is making our kids really stressed out. So we need to reduce the amount of homework teachers are allowed to um, assign. She shares a perspective that you don't want to miss. That's on the next Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? folks um 
O.J. Simpson is still the talk of the country after news uh, came out yesterday that uh, he died at the age of 76 of prostate cancer. It was announced by uh, his family. Uh, this was just a couple of months ago on February 11th uh, when O.J. Simpson posted this video uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, I'm going to play this for you. Uh, and it, um, of course, he was, you know, after he got out of prison uh, in uh, Nevada, he was uh, quite prolific uh, on uh, Twitter, always uh, posting uh, various videos, uh, commenting on all sorts of stories. And so here was the last uh, video post. Hey, x World, it's me, yours truly. Boy, what a beautiful day it is here in Las Vegas. Even though the game is indoors, it wouldn't have mattered, but still, it's nice to have a beautiful day like this. Hey, let me take a moment to say thank you to all the people who've reached out to me. Uh, uh, my health is good. I mean, obviously, I'm dealing with some issues, uh, but hey, I think I'm just about over it, and I'll be uh, back on that golf course, hopefully, in a couple of weeks. But it was very nice hearing from you and hearing those good, positive words. Thank you. Now, as far as the game goes, uh, obviously, my prediction... That was February 11th. Two months later, O.J. Simpson was dead, uh, of dying of prostate cancer. All sort of stories uh, have been done. Uh, folks uh, uh, talking about the recollections of O.J. This New York Times article I, f I found to be quite interesting. Uh, this is what it says. O.J. was a, an earthquake were still living with his aftershocks. He tried to shed his blackness, but his all-consuming murder trial put the historically lurid American psyche on full display. Carl Douglas served on the legal dream team uh, during that murder trial for O.J. Simpson. He joins us right now. Uh, Carl, first of all, glad to have you. Uh, I know a lot of folks been trying to get your, your perspective, your thoughts um, uh, on O.J. Uh, before I ask a series of questions. When was the last time you talked or saw O.J.? You know, Roland, first, thank you so much for having me on your show, Myth. I really appreciate it. The last time that I spoke to O.J. was probably the day after the verdict in 1995. The last time that I saw him was in April of 2005. That was during Johnny Cochran's funeral here in Los Angeles. Reverend Al Sharpton was giving the eulogy, and he first asked the audience. 5,000 people filled the audience. It was so crowded, Oprah Winfrey was turned away at the front door. But he first looked around and said, how many people have ever worked with Johnny L. Cochran? And I stood up, and many others who worked with him stood up as well. Then he asked, how many people here today had ever been represented by Johnny L. Cochran. And I turned to my right and I saw Michael Jackson stand up. And run one row back and maybe four or five seats away, I saw OJ stand up as well. That sight of seeing Michael Jackson and OJ Simpson there together at that same place is a vision that I'll probably take with me to my grave, brother. When you look at um, how even today there is still such a visceral reaction when f just the mention of the name O.J. Simpson. Uh, I mean, I have seen memes. I've seen posts. I've seen folks reliving the trial, reposting items, uh, talking about how uh, it was wrong. Jurors have been interviewed on different networks. Several of them said, look, we got it right. Uh, you know, what was it, from your perspective, what was it about this case that was unlike any other in American history? Because it was a perfect storm, Roland, of a whodunit. And layered on that was race. And layered on that was celebrity. And layered on that was domestic violence. And layered on that was entertainment in Los Angeles, some would say the media capital of the world. This was before X, Facebook, or Instagram. The only game in town at that time was the O.J. Simpson trial. And so it really held the nation transfixed. When the verdict was rendered on October the 3rd of 1995, there were as many as 150 million people, more than one third of the entire nation of this 
great nation of ours, were tuned in to watch that verdict. You hear about perhaps 14, 15, 19 million people watching the women's basketball game. But when you think about 150 million, 10 times that number of people watching one event, it really tells you the impact it has had on American history and American culture. Sir, people, white, black, young and old, always will want to have a conversation with me about the O.J. Simpson trial whenever I deign to bring it up. I mean, it, it really, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it had, it hit every, it checked every single box. Uh, I mean, you had, you know, athlete, rich guy, he black, the ex-wife was white, Ron Goldman, you had, I mean, it, it was everything all just converging at one time. And it really was about drawing a line in the sand. Folk was straight up in offices around the country picking sides. And, and, and it, was, it was an absolute black-white issue. And what was interesting about that is because you also had this black man who, was do, who did everything he could to run away from black people and who openly talked about it. So th that's also what was fascinating. And then you got racist Mark Furman, you got the N-word, you got, I mean, you, this, I can't think what this trial didn't have. Sure, man. but it also talks about the resiliency and how great black people are. Because OJ was known for saying, I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yet and still, when he got arrested, when he got in trouble. His black ass was black. He was embraced by the black community. He was one of us again now. And so the response at the verdict wasn't anything about OJ per se, but finally, once in this country, the system seemed to work in favor of a black man. And, and that is what we were rejoicing viscerally. And that, Mark Lamont Hill actually tweeted that and a lot of people got upset uh, with his tweet. Uh, when he talked about that, where he said that the justice system worked out, worked the way it was supposed to work because the state did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And people got upset with him, and he said, I'm, he said, I'm not saying O.J. Uh, wasn't guilty. He said, I'm not saying he was guilty. He said, the onus on the prosecution is to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And he said, and the reality is... The doubt was there. And it's not, the juror's question, Roland, is not whether he is guilty or innocent. That's not the test. The test is whether the government has met its burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I can tell you this, Roland, there's a different burden in civil courts. They only have to prove that there's a preponderance of the evidence, more likely to be true than not true. 50.001%. And I dare say, if I were on that jury in Santa Monica for the civil verdict, I understand how they would rule that there's 50.1% proof against O.J. Simpson civilly, but I also embrace and understand why this jury f felt that the prosecution had failed in their burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. For you, uh, being a part of this uh, legal defense team, many call the dream team. Um, um, what was it like for you being in the midst of it, seeing the stories, jury was, was, was sequestered, but seeing the stories and hearing everything was being talked about, hearing how everybody was being talked about, then, of course, you had, we, we've, we've heard these battles between Shapiro and Cochran and who was in charge, and it was like, okay, we got the white lawyers over here and the black lawyers over here. Then you had the F. Lee Bailey who was like, I'm going to be with the black lawyers. And so you, so you, had, this ra you had this, you had a racial dynamic in the country of the trial. You had a racial dynamic on the prosecution side and a racial dynamic on the defense side. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, Roland, because rarely in life do you have a chance to stop, step back and say, you know, this is going to be important. And I fortunately had that wisdom moment when I was there in the trial. 
I was 40 years old, man, working with some of the greatest legal minds in America. F. Lee Bailey was my personal hero. Johnny Cochran, I thought, was the greatest lawyer in the world at that moment in time. Alan Dershowitz was a legal titan in the appellate world. So I can remember times sitting back on Saturday afternoons and just taking it all in because we would all meet and talk about the past week and the prior week. And some of the greatest legal minds coming together, talking about the same issues, was, a, was like finishing school, graduate school for me, who was a 15-year lawyer then in 1995. Have you, because of your involvement with this, have, me, have you, do you have folk today who are still mad and pissed off at you? I don't know if it's because I'm a younger brother or what it is, but I have never had a negative word said to me in my face. In fact, ironically, um, Mark Furman wrote in his book, I've never read it, but I was told it says, if the entire dream team had performed like Carl Douglas, the case would not have turned into a circus. People may have all of these extraordinary views and opinions, but I can say I have never in my face been confronted with a problem. And I am one of the few people, Roland, on behalf of the defense who will go on TV and talk about the case and defend the verdict. My community embraces me. I am welcomed. I am uplifted. And I continue to raise and uplift the memory and the legacy of my man, my friend and mentor, Johnny L. Cochran Jr., who died in 2005, because I know if he were alive, he would be in my place talking about his, his success in that case 100%. Uh, I'm going to go to some questions from the panel uh, after this question, but I got to ask you this here. We, we, we've all seen that video of the verdict being read and the look on um, Kardashian's, Kardashian. Kardashian's face. Uh, and when, when, that, when, that, when that happens and then y'all retreat to a room, um, what was that like? I mean, and, and do you believe that he was shocked by the verdict? Because it's, again, everyone, everybody makes these assumptions that, oh, he, he clearly thought oh, that O.J. was going was gonna, to was gonna be found guilty and it was stunned when uh, the jury came back. I was in the second row inside the well. My back was to he and F. Lee Bailey. So I didn't see that, that look on his face, though I, I, I know what you're describing because they mentioned to me as well. We all went back to the back and celebrated. High fives, hugging happy, joyous. There was not a hint or an indication, even from Bob Shapiro, that he was going to go that night and turn his back on the entire defense team. So I'm not a mind reader. I understand the question, but I have no insight whatsoever into what was going on in his mind at that moment. But I do know when we were all together, we were all celebrating after that day. When you say uh, what Shapiro did, uh, for folks who don't know, he, he, I think he did an interview with Barbara Walters. He did, yes. And he had an interview with them the night that night. And he said that the defense team had played the race card and had dealt from the bottom of the deck. That was offensive because the whole concept of using race as a defense ploy was a concept that he developed before Johnny Cochran was ever a lawyer on the case. So the hypocrisy of that statement was clear to all of us. We were at OJ's house partying the night of the verdict. I remember watching it on the TV screen when he went and was talking to Barbara Walters. And y'all were like, the hell is he doing? And more. OJ was very vocal, man. Okay? <laughs> and very vocal. He was expressing anger and surprise, and he was talking, and he had this con this console that had three or four different TV screens on going at the same time, each one on a different news station. And he would be pacing around and, and yelling and talking and doing all kinds of... But then we all stopped to listen to Bob gave the interview. <laughs> wow. Uh, let's go. Matt, you're first. 
Well, let me let me first geek out a, a little bit and say uh, it is an honor to just be on the screen with you, uh, Mr. Douglas. Uh, God willing, I have just a fraction of the legacy as a lawyer that you have, and and I'm able to be a part of a team as impactful as, as yours. So let me give you your flowers first. Right. And I don't want you to break privilege, but I'd, I'd love to know the answer to this question. So one thing I find is a black lawyer is a lot of times black clients just feel a kinship with me that they may not feel with other people on the team. I know we've talked about some of the racial issues, but what was your feeling, if you can speak to that, about how OJ aligned with the differing views in the room in terms of strategy and just what role race played even inside the team and in terms of how the client was responding to various strategies and going forward, if you can speak to that. It was amazing, brother, because before that, OJ chose not to see race in his life. He, he, he melded well between all racial groups and was probably very comfortable in the white world of Brentwood. At the same time, though, he was a brother from Hunter's Point in San Francisco. The brother could talk trash, play bid whist, roll some dice, and be on that level as well. And he became more understanding of the significance of race in the criminal justice system as the case evolved over the course of the many months and years. And it's, it's, it's unique in Los Angeles because no one could understand the O.J. Simpson verdict without understanding the racial dynamics which were then present in Los Angeles in that time and in that place. And I dare say, as a lawyer there for 44 years, man, if anyone tries a case in Los Angeles and ignores the object or the subject of race, they do so to their own peril. I consider race in choosing experts and figuring out who, what witnesses to call and when, because it is, regrettably, an important factor in everything that we do as lawyers. Kelly. Thank you. I echo Matt's sentiments and being on the same screen as you, sir. It is an honor. Um, the Maybe. law nerd in me is also geeking out, so I will reel it back a little bit. My question to you isn't necessarily regarding legal strategy so much as it is, and I think it's fair to say your attenuated relationship with O.J. Simpson since the trial, based off of what you just said, the last time you saw him, the last time you spoke with him, has your lens in regards to who O.J. is, in regards to how the case played out, has that been cloudied? Has that been cleared up? Has it shifted at all since the verdict? And if so, why? It's funny because my career took off after the verdict. I remember most of what I did before that time was as a civil rights lawyer. And I would appear in civil court and say my name and who I worked for, and the entire courtroom would go silent to hear what the lawyer from Johnny Cochran's office would say. And that was a tremendously powerful um, residue for my career. I left his office within years of the verdict, opening up my own firm. And the connection that I had with that case is in Los Angeles, very uplifting, very powerful. I don't advertise because I really don't have to. My work works for me. But it is the value of my involvement in that case um, that has only uplifted me and my career for the 30 years since then. I used to, in the beginning, not want to embrace my involvement until I realized when a wise person told me it's important that you are known for something. That which is considered the trial of the century, and we won. And as a trial lawyer, winning the biggest case in your career is something that we all would embrace and want to be a part of. As any lawyer who's a trial lawyer can tell you, when the game is on the line, when the clock is running down, I want the ball in my hand so that I can be the one to make the decisions and to do that thing that, I, that is best for my client and that's just a special part of a personality of a trial lawyer, I think. Michael. All right, Attorney Douglas, thanks for coming on today. Uh, I remember watching the trial live on CNN. This is even before MSNBC existed, so I watched it basically every day. Uh, the question I have for you is I was watching some analysis from uh, Attorney Reva Martin 
on uh, uh, CNN, and she was talking about Mark Furman and Mark Furman um, allegations of him using the N word and, and him perjuring himself on the witness stand during that trial. And uh, I think a lot of people may have forgotten about that, may not even know who Mark Furman is. Can you talk about that uh, for a minute? And uh, just a quick follow up question, if I may. I just wanted to know. Um, what do you think was the biggest piece of evidence or lack of piece of evidence that uh, got O.J. Simpson the acquittal? Look, Mark Furman was a central detective who found a glove at the Rockingham location. He had, years before, petitioned a, the city of Los Angeles to allow him to, to, to retire with benefits because he harbored such virulent, racist, violent attitudes against mm -hmm. black and brown prisoners and suspects, that he thought he was a danger to himself and to others. They, he hated them so much that, he would, that they would beat him, and he, he relished that kind of violence. So in Los Angeles, there is such distrust in that, at that moment between the police and the African-American community. You could probably stop anyone on the streets of Los Angeles who was black at random, and they could tell you a story of themselves their friend or their family member being treated unfairly by the LAPD. That distrust is something that we as the defense fed into. And when you had a central detective who took the Fifth Amendment in a murder case, that was clearly a bright line. But the seminal piece of evidence, I say, that really turned the tide was that glove demonstration that we all remember when the murder glove didn't fit on the hand of the accused murderer that was a visual sign that seared into the memory of the jurors irrespective that there were 30 days of mind numbing dna evidence irrespective that there were three weeks spent on the domestic relationships and the problems that they had in their past marriage. When there was a dramatic, in-your-face, feet-away demonstration, and the murder glove did not fit the hand of the murderer, that, I think, was the moment when we all thought that a, con that a conviction was going to be impossible and that a not guilty verdict would prevail. All right, Michael, get a follow-up. Come on. <laughs> See, Roland, that's how smooth I am. <laughs> I asked two of them together. All right, that fine. Was follow up. Well, just making sure. Just make, uh, Matt, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I, I have to ask this. I'm sure everybody wants to know. So, you talked about the glove demonstration. Was there a point before then when Johnny Cochran came up with the line and y'all were like, that's going to slay in closing argument? Or was that something off the cuff? Number one, I have to ask. And number two, Please tell us what it was like working. I mean, you are one of the legends, but what it was it like working with Brother Cochran? Because he's obviously, you know, most of our hero as lawyers, one of our heroes. And I'd love to know what that experience was like beyond formative, of course. Surely. <clears throat> the weekend after that glove demonstration, we would gather every Saturday in our conference room. There'd be 12 lawyers, investigators, staff sitting there working together. And there was a speaker phoning. Jerry Ullman, who was then the dean of Santa Clara's Law School, was on the phone. And Jerry Ullman said, hey, guys, hey, guys, I got a saying for us. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And we all first paused for a moment, thought about it, and the entire room erupted. Hey, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Hey, 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 hey. It was a moment that I will always remember, and, and Jerry Ullman was the one that thought of that phrase. Your second question, I was with Johnny Cochran for 12 and a half years. I always enjoyed being the man who whispered into the ear of the man. That Amen. was all to me, the seat of power. And I would always tell the lawyers, I don't care what you think, trust his instincts, because the brother had instincts that were gleaned over doing trials, three, four, five trials a week as a city attorney for many years. Yep. He had instincts because he knew how things would play. He knew how people would be able to react to things. 
and as important, he had a remarkable ability. Brother, I can't do it. He could be kicking your tail during trial and at a break, saunter over to the other side and ask you about your family. How's the wife yeah. doing? How's the kid doing? He had that remarkable ability to compartmentalize and um, prosecutors, defense lawyers alike loved him some Johnny Cochran. He had, he had that smooth way that was able to impress everyone he was around. All right, then. Uh, Carl Douglas, um, last question. When you look at all of this coverage and when you look at these conflicted feelings, just, just your assessment of how um, you have there's these multiple versions of who O.J. Simpson was and how he is going to be remembered for the rest of eternity. It's going to be complicated, regrettably, Roland. Hopefully, there will be some remembrance and recognition, recognition of how great an athlete he was in the first half of his life. But regrettably, particularly with the advent of social media, he will be most remembered for someone that America thinks got away with murder. That, I think, unfortunately, will be the lasting memory of my former client, O.J. Simpson. Carl Douglas, always a pleasure, man. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Brother, have me back again, please, always. Enjoy being with you. We'll have you back on. Thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. Stay well. All right. Uh, Matt, Kelly. Michael, I appreciate y'all being on today's show. Thank you so very much, uh, all those folks who are watching. Coming up next, a frank and honest conversation. Y'all don't want to miss this. Y'all might want to have the kids lead the room, though. I'm going to be chatting with uh, my homegirl, Dr. Rachel, sexologist. We talk about uh, sexual health, but also talk about the reality of what folk got to do to keep that thing going strong the older that they get. It's going to be quite an interesting conversation. Trust me, y'all actually might learn something. I think you will. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, nurses are the backbone of the healthcare industry, and yet only 7% of them are Black. What's the reason for that low number? Well, a lack of opportunities and growth in their profession. Joining us on the next Get Wealthy is Needy Bartonilla. She's going to be sharing exactly what nurses need to do and what approach they need to take to take ownership of their success. So the Black Nurse Collaborative really spawned from a place and a desire to create opportunities to uplift each other those of us in the profession, to also look and reach back and create, and create pipelines and opportunities for other nurses like us. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. On a next, A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. It's spring, hallelujah, but hold on. It's not all fun and games. With the sun and the warmth comes the need to clean the clutter mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. All of those things need to happen. Getting rid of the clutter and clearing the cobwebs in our head and in our home. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app 
with over 600,000 users, is raising $17 million, and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, Hey, yo, what's up? It's Mr. Dalvin right here. What's up? This is KC. Sitting here representing the J-O-D-E-C-I. That's Jodeci. Right here on Rolling Martin.